All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Nitha Ramachandra from the Anna Hour Sports Show. This is episode 863. We're joined by a really special guest. Uh, obviously, I'm alongside with Kia Lyons, one of our co-hosts for the team, and we're joined by a really special guest. His name is Glenn Parker. He's a former NFL offensive lineman. He played for the Bills, Chiefs, Giants. He also played for Arizona in college, and now he's a TV analyst for NBC Sports. So I'm really looking forward to this, looking forward to this interview. And Glenn, thank you again for joining us today. It's truly an honor. And how are you and your family doing? And uh, like you said, you're, you're on vacation right now, so. <laughs> I'm on vacation. And, and oh, just, Glenn, thank you. Oh, thank you. Pleasure. Really, and uh, pleasure to be on. Um, yeah, no, I am uh, no longer with NBC Sports. I was oh. for many years, and then the Pac-12 Network and NFL Network and many others. But no, I'm no longer with them. I've actually just, just in the last couple of years transitioned into a role with the University of Arizona where I've coached more, okay. as well as, uh, as a fundraising role now uh, for the university. And uh, as of about two months ago, I stopped, I retired from doing uh, broadcast for the Cardinals as well, because my son and daughter both play fall sports in college and I didn't want to miss anything. So I'm still heavily involved. I still with the football world, but I just, I, I'm no longer on TV. Okay. Well, good for you. That's so great to be fully present to go with the flow and, and you know, you're representing by being there for them. That's awesome. Tell us a little bit about how your, your career in football got started, like from the young age. Were you always into football? Did you play other sports? So I love when I get interviews like this because what I love about it is um, you, you know that I played, but you, it's not out there a lot. You kind of have to dig. I, I didn't play football in high school. Oh, wow. I didn't play any sports in high school. I loved football as a kid, loved baseball, played flag football, Little League, everything. But about the age of 14, I think I'd had enough. I, uh, I, I didn't mature as fast as other boys. You know, I was kind of one of those, I, I like to, when I'm coaching, I like to tell mom and dad, listen, boys are not all the same. They're like popcorn. You know, some pops right away, some pops with a big group and some pop late. Well, I'm one of those late poppers. And uh, I love that. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that I was into surfing and, and beach volleyball and playing basketball at the course. I just wasn't into organized sports. I wasn't mature enough to handle that. And then uh, both physically and mentally. And then for, at the end of high school, into junior college, I realized I was big, I was athletic. Guys that, that I knew that were professional athletes for the Rams, mm -hmm. for NBA guys, knew me from my job. I was a bouncer at a local bar illegally and they saw me playing hoops. And they're like, dude, you surf and play basketball and you're 6'5", 285. Is there a reason you're not playing, you're not in college being an athlete? And I thought that sounds good. So it's sure going to be paying for college and working as a bouncer. So I walked onto a junior college football team in Huntington Beach, California, where I'm from. And I had great coaches right from the start taught me the game. And uh, I've started seven games for them. And then I was, I kind of had my pick and I chose Arizona for the coach. Uh, Dick told me he was a guy that understood what he was doing and he recruited me compared to all the others. And that's a story we can get into at some time if you like, but, uh, and so Going to Arizona is the best thing because then 21 games later, I was starting for the Buffalo Bills. So I played about 29 games my whole career before I ever stepped on a pro football field and, and started. So That's incredible. We get all the serendipitous stories here. It's incredible. It's amazing. And man, uh, I want to ask you though, uh, and so obviously you played, you started football in college. So take me to the transition and the adjustment period for you, not playing football in high school, but starting in college. And obviously you played offensive linemen, but did you, did you, um, did you want to try other positions before office alignment or did you always want it to be office alignment? Did you walk no, on with a surfboard? <laughs> I, I, what I wanted more than any, I, I thought I was going to be a, a D end or tight end just with my speed and size. I, I thought, and when I went in to, to go out for the team, I thought I was talking to the head coach and it turned out I was talking to the offensive line coach. <laughs> And he's like, great, uh, meet me at this time. And so that's how I became an offensive lineman. And, wow. and seven games when I was recruited, there were schools that recruited me as a DN. Tennessee was one of them. They wow. said, no, you're not really a tackle. You need to be a DN. And I was like, well, I, I've only ever played this position. I think I'm going to stick with it for now. And so that's, it, you know, the transition itself, that's how I became an offensive lineman. It's, it's tough. You know, every, everybody – on the outside knows football, but they really don't know football. They don't um, understand the game. They know the game, they don't understand it, put it that way. So being thrust into a room where I didn't speak the language at all, all these other guys, it's second nature to them, these little things, you know, uh, yeah. what's your split? 
what's your depth? What's your cadence? What's your responsibility? What gap do you have? What technique do you use? All the words that are used, it's an entirely different language. And if you've never played or been in that room long enough to learn it, you, it's, I can say it's the best way to learn total immersion. It's the way to learn a foreign language, right? You want to learn a language. Yeah, that's what I just thought of, yeah. And that's what I did. I went to another country and I immersed myself and I learned the language very quickly of the game of football. And that was stressful. It was intimidating. You know, yeah. guys, a lot of testosterone in that room, but um, I learned, I, I, the guys were great. They helped me out. The coaches helped me out and no one, no one thought they were better than me because I hadn't played. They just taught me. And I'm still good friends with some of those guys who were before me uh, that went on to college careers. We still talk and uh, it's, it was just a good environment to kind of transition into the game of football for me. No, that's awesome. That's amazing. That's true teamwork. I mean, because it had to be emotionally overwhelming just to be there as a rookie without your family. You know what I mean? I mean, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, you you once you step into that room, there's no friends. You don't know anybody. You don't speak their language. Uh, it's physical. It's ego driven. There's a lot of testosterone, and yet it was, and maybe it wouldn't have worked in other positions. I don't know, but offensive line is a brotherhood. It's five guys who are working as one, and yeah, and everybody's pulling the rope the same direction. We're all trying to get where we want to be, and that was I think that was probably being an offensive lineman helped me more than anything. I think maybe the only thing else I could have been is maybe a wide receiver or something where it's kind of more, a little more individual out there than it is with the O-line. Real quick, did you have any feelings? Were you like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is so much and, and any kind of doubt and then just this fear that you thought, well, but yes, I'm here and I'm doing it and I'm seeing it through and I'm going to be successful. Like what kind of thoughts did you have like that going through that's your a, head? That's a perfect question, Kia. It's I often speak of the need to overcome failure. You can't fear failure. You have to love it. Failure has to become a part of you. It has to be something you just love because it's how you learn. It's how you yeah. grow. If, if, you don't, if you don't fail, you can't grow. Um, nobody just succeeds right off the bat. So yeah, there was I, the, the first day I got hit, you know, I took a big shot and I think the coaches were looking at me wondering what was going to happen. And I went home that night and I got on the couch and that hurt a lot. And I woke up the next morning sore yeah. as hell and said, I want to do it again. I'm, I've got to see this through. Cause at about the same time I walked on that football team, I remember looking in the mirror going, you know, everything that happens to you in life is your responsibility. It's no one else's. And yeah. you know, if you take personal responsibility for yourself, you don't rely on other people to, to pay your bills or make your way. Mm -hmm. Once you just take responsibility for everything, it, it's freedom because yeah. now all you can do is fail and then failure is growth. And so it really, it, it really, it kind of all came in this big ball of energy and circle that went on. And it was a lot of times I questioned myself early on. Um, it was a process, but the coach wouldn't let me quit and players didn't let me get down. They just built me up. And, and once it clicked, it clicked, it clicked really hard and fast and brightly for me. Once it, once it all kicked in. Hmm. That's powerful. Yeah, that's really, that's truly powerful. And um, this is a two-part question. Yeah, I want to ask you, obviously, the pre-draft process now is a little a little bit different from when you play, but take me back to your pre-draft because you only played 29 games in college and uh, started playing football in college. So how many teams, NFL teams, were interested in you in the pre-draft process? And take me back to your draft call when you got drafted by the Bills at, in 1990. So um, the Bills were one that never talked to me, not oh. once. Um, the Steelers, the Cowboys, there were a lot of teams that came out, uh, talked to me at different times, the Bengals, um, at different times they came out, they met me at my junior college to talk to my coaches, they wanted to interview teachers of mine, they wanted to know more about me, since there was not some great background of me, they didn't have a, a high school recruiting form, they didn't have any of those things on me. And I think they did their homework and they realized he's a quick study and he's a leader on the team and a captain. And so um, I, they, 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 back then we didn't take trips in unless you were like a quarterback, first round, high first round quarterback guy. Nobody took a trip in anywhere. They just, and yes, I went to the combine. That was the cattle call. It still is. We do the, all the same test, everything. Nothing has really changed there. What's changed, I think, is for a long time, there was an emphasis on your workouts in the combine, not 
during when I was in the process as much as a little after me. And I think we're finally getting back around to realizing football is what's important. A, a person can be great looking in their underwear, run around and run great routes or look like an athlete and lift all sorts of weight and you get them on the field and they can't play. Uh, the game's about nuance. The game's about uh, so much more than just being strong in the weight room. And uh, there was a joke at the Buffalo weight room, the strength guy used to have my sayings in there. And one of them was the strongest guys never play. And what I meant by that, and I used to say, was a guy who gets really super strong, you'll always see him in the weight room, but he's never working on his weaknesses. Hmm. He's always working on that strength. Where his weakness is he's not good in the playbook and he doesn't move well. That's what he should be working on. I was in the weight room a lot because that was my weakness. I didn't have that background of lifting like everybody else. So um, I think that emphasis on the physical being has finally started to subside. They're starting to realize, can the guy play football or not? Let's look at his film. Let's let that decide. And unless he's just an absolute train wreck physically, when we see him, that's the guy we want. I think we're going back to that a little bit. Hmm. Some great advice that, I, that I've read before and I stick with is to be independent of the good opinion of others. And last night in one, one of players book, I read about how at a combine, he had just like woke up and just read about somebody who said, you know, he, he were, were concerned that he doesn't have the work ethic and this and that. And it was in a newspaper. Tell us about, about de how does that phase you? Did you ever listen to any, any, um, any coverage on yourself? So I think you, uh, the only time I really ever did was after my junior season, I had never even thought of the NFL hardly. I wasn't really in my wheelhouse. My roommate got drafted in the fourth round and uh, my, my other very close teammate friend got drafted in the second round, both offensive linemen. And the agents were like, we'll see you next year. And I'm like, see me, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah, I was starting and yeah, I was a, I was all conference, but I just didn't put myself in there in that light yet. Mm -hmm. And my brother sent me a clipping from Sports Illustrated. You know, we didn't have internet back then. It was a cutout. Mm -hmm. And it named me as one of the top tackles in, the offense, in, in college football for next year. And I was like, maybe I do have a chance at this. All of a sudden, it became real that oh, that's awesome. someone thought I could get there. And then that put me to the next level of trying to get there. Um, something you said, you know, don't be – try to be independent of, what, of the opinion of others. It's kind of the old – Never take advice from, uh, never take criticism from somebody you wouldn't look to for advice. And that's, yeah, that's it, great. And, and it also goes hand in hand with how, how do you, how do you, what, how do you let the words of others affect you? And I, one of my, my favorites is if I like, and it goes to coaching. I don't, I don't care what Joe Blow in the stands thinks of me as a player. What I care about is what my coach thinks of me as a player. Mm -hmm. And that's where I want to hear all the bad things I've done. And right now in the business world, I tell, I told my colleagues, when I first came on board, please don't give me kudos, give me criticism. Tell me what I'm doing wrong so I can correct it. Because those are the people now I'm in their world trying to be like them. I don't care what the guy who owns the bar thinks of my fundraising efforts. What I care is my bar, my owners, my, my colleagues think about me. Am I good at my job? So it's kind of, you have to have two worlds there, right? Where you don't worry about the opinion of others unless they're the people you're seeking advice from. And those right, are right to get that growth. Yep. Yeah. The one you care about. Hmm. So I want to ask you, uh, obviously you got drafted, drafted by the Buffalo Bills and you're part of that um, Jim Kelly era, Andre Reed, Sherman Thomas, and you, they, you guys had a, a great roster. And what was, it, what was it like playing for Bills Mafia? And it, it's growing big time now. The Bills team is amazing. Um, so it, what was it like playing in that era with Jim Kelly, being able to block for him and Thurman Thomas, one of the best running backs in the game? So, I, yeah, it was incredible. And the thing is, Thurman was the real – he was that motor. Um, he could do it all. He's, he was, he's the best running back I've ever uh, ever played with. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be very close between he and Marcus Allen. I mean, Marcus Allen is – Maybe, may, but I didn't get him in his prime. I got him towards the end of his career. And he, and for me to say that about him, it's still, that's how good he was. Yeah. But Thurman could do so much. And he allowed us to play a style that we could open it up much more like today's game is. And now you're seeing a lot more backs like him in the league. You know, uh, Marshall Falk was the next one that came about. And then more and more that back that 
doesn't come off the field, doesn't need to come off the field in third and long. He can stay on the field. You can put him in the slot, and now he's a wide receiver for you. Um, that's tough because it creates pro matchup problems for the defense. It puts them in conflict. Do they keep a linebacker on in case Thurman's in the backfield, or do they go nickel and, and just cover him with the nickel back? You know, and, and so you've got – but, if, you know, obviously what we were good at is Jim Kelly was very smart at seeing that. They're in nickel. We have Thurman in the game – and they don't have that extra running back or extra linebacker. We're going to audible to a run, make the nickel back come up and make a play and on a, on a third down run. So we could do so much because of him and our tight ends and Jim Kelly's ability to see everything on the field. And our defense was very opportunistic, did a really good job of exploiting the mistakes others made because we scored a lot of points. They were keeping up and then they could exploit it. And never forget the, the impact of the fans there. You know, Buffalo Bills Mafia, as you know, you mentioned, they're famous now because of the internet. But when we played, watch any game on TV then, and we led the league in attendance those years, 79,000, 80,000 every game, absolutely out of control parking lot back then. <laughs> it was, it was uh, the people in Buffalo like a good time. They're, they're going to have their good time and, and Bills games are it. You're, you're so detail oriented. I imagine that you are awesome at coaching because you, you seem to look at all the details and then I imagine what's not working and make it work, which is so awesome. Walk us through the first experience of walking, of putting on the gear, NFL gear, stepping onto the field. What were you feeling? How is that? So oh, there's two. And I thank you for bringing that up because there's actually two. The first time is that first preseason game. We played Monday night against the Giants. I'm starting at left tackle. Our left tackle is holding out. And I remember being excited, but it was preseason. And I was pumped because I'm starting in the NFL, but it's preseason, the first preseason game too. So, you know, it means nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But to you, it was everything. Yeah, to me, it's everything. And I went out and I played well. We, I don't even know if we won or lost now. I can't remember. I remember playing well and people going, wow, that was a great showing by the rookie and whatnot. But then getting ready for the first preseason of uh, the first real season game. I was starting at left tackle. Now, five weeks later, maybe six weeks later, we're playing Indianapolis and I am so fired up. I run out on the field. The fans are out of control loud. And I realize they're introducing offense. I have to run back in and I'm the second introduction to run back out. I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> so I got all the way out there and I'm looking and it's all defensive guys. I went, wait a minute. It's offense and I'm the left tackle. So I had to run in and I'm sprinting down there right as they call James Lofter to come out and then they call my name and I jog back out. I was gassed before the game began. <laughs> That's crazy. That's fantastic. I love yeah. it. Nerves got me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, before we get to your Chiefs career, I want to ask you about Jim Kelly because um, he has overcome a lot with cancer and he's improving a lot and what a great player he was. And for you, to be able to be his teammate and uh, what was he like, not only on the field, but what was he like off the field when you guys were hanging out with the team and doing, doing things in the community and what was he like off the field and did you reach out to him when he was going through the cancer situation? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We were, the, the Bill's family's tight. We still do, um, we still do Zooms once in a while, things like that. We've all kind of stayed somewhat in touch. Um, Jim was a competitor first and foremost. So it didn't matter what he did off the field, on the field, he was going to compete fiery um on the field you knew you were never out of it yeah i mean just we're never going to be out of this game just to, with the talent we had and jim seeing things he saw we know we were never going to be out of that game off the field jim the problem jim had off the field is he was so easily recognizable in buffalo he couldn't do the things like most people could i'll never forget i was dating my now wife about my second year in the league Maybe my third. I take it back. It was my third. And we went to uh, the Erie County Fair because we had a day off from camp. And so we just walked around the fair. And he goes, man, how was that? I go, oh, I love the fair. You know, I love the livestock and all that. Just a great. And he goes, I wish I could do that. I can't. I can't go out. I'd be mobbed. And I thought, man, that sucks. And I felt that bad. Does. Um, it's such a small town. Everybody knows who you are. Yeah, me, they stare at. Me. Jim, they mob. And so I, I think the hardest part for Jim off the field is just trying to lead a normal life in Buffalo. Any place else he could have maybe got lost a little, 
I know in New York, it's that way. You can get lost. Nobody, nobody cares that you're famous. Same with LA. Nobody cares that you're famous, but in Buffalo, you're, you're it. You're, you're the, you're the dog. Can you share any, that's great. Is there, um, it's great that you guys, you had that connection. Tell us about any fellowship or any kind of prayer, um, groups or, or how did you guys have, did you have meetings often to stay well connected and, um, emotionally? Well, the, so, um, in the NFL, the FCA is very popular and very big. And there was a very large FCA group at the Buffalo Bills um, led, by, led by, you know, Steve Tasker, Mark Kelso. Um, and that's one aim. And, and, and then, of course, there's there's a Catholic mass before, before every game. There's a uh, non-denominational mass. So there's that way. But the way we stayed connected was Buffalo being a small town, we just did a lot together because it, it was a way for us to kind of feel normal. When you're around guys that have the same, uh, same problems you have, the same socioeconomic status that you have somewhat anyways, um, you're in similar straits. It can, I mean, cause that's who we hang out with anyways. In their real life, that's who we seek out as friends, people in the position we are, right. or those we want to be like. And so that's what tends to happen in Buffalo or did for us because there just was, it's it, when, again, I start, you know, it's snowmobiling trips together. Um, every off season, every bye week of the season, we'd have a pig roast and paintball war out at my house out in the woods. Um, that's awesome. We could do as a group and have a lot of fun and camaraderie and fellowship without, without it being a newspaper article. Does yeah. that make sense? Cause that's yeah. what happens. You, you go out and you do something, it becomes news. And we knew that. We just needed to stay around each other more. And that's really what built the, the fellowship we had. That's great. Wow. Yeah, so uh, Glenn, I got to tell you right now, you're one of the luckiest office linemen to play the game because uh, you, when you went to the Chiefs, like you said, you got to play with Marcus Allen, Joe Horn, Derek Thomas. You, you played with Hall of Fame, Will Shields, the guard, uh, also Tony Gonzalez. And uh, you, you blocked for Rich Gannon. What was that like going from the Bills uh, to, to another great organization with the Chiefs? Well, first off, I'll correct you. I don't believe in luck. I don't think there's any such thing. I could tell the way you saw, I could tell that. So Marv Levy always said this, and I loved it. If there's such a thing as luck, how come bad teams are never lucky? He goes, they always lose. Bad teams lose. If there was luck, they'd win games. They'd win half the games. They don't win half the games. They lose. They lose 14 games a year. You know, it's terrible stuff. Yeah. Um, I loved going to the Chiefs. The th thing about the Chiefs is when I got there, the offensive line, I knew two of the guys already very well. I had played against all the guys many times. Um, all, they were a lot of guys of similar age. So we all were kind of the same age. I, whereas when I got to the Bills, I was the youngest and I was not married. And by the time I got married and we started aging out of the Super Bowl years, I was now the oldest because we'd flipped over to a mostly rookie lo uh, locker room. I got to the Chiefs and I was one of all the same age guys. It was an absolute blast for three years. We were a good team. Tony Gonzalez was a young young kid. And well, we, we lockered next to each other. And what was nice about Tony is, you know, he was naive and, and, and goofy, but he was from my same hometown. He came from Huntington Beach as well. And, you know, it, it, Huntington Beach turns out a lot of great athletes, but not a whole lot of NFL players at the same time. And, and we were there. And, you know, uh, Marcus Allen was a true pro. And when I say that, couldn't have been more welcoming. The best short yardage back to ever play the game. Maybe the, one of the nicest people that I've ever been in a locker room with. Uh, we had Andre Risen. We had Joe Horn. We had Rich Gannon. Hasty. We had, we had Derek Thomas. We had a, a who's who of great players. And it was a great locker room. And I think a lot of that was the coaches that did that. The head coach, Marty Schottenheimer, was so tough and such a hard guy. We were forced to be good friends as teammates because none of us really, we always had some gripe about him. Now, we all loved him to death. And we still, I mean, we still do. We miss him yeah. greatly. But hard coaches do that. They build a team who becomes unified in their feelings about that guy. <laughs> and we were. We loved him, but we just hated him sometimes. <laughs> Glenn, sh share with us a little bit how you've used your platform, your football flat platform, to give back um, to your community. Well, I, so it starts with 
I, I've, I've coached for free for years. I'll coach any player, offensive lineman that wants to learn. Um, I never, charge, I'll never charge a kid who wants to learn football. And nobody, nobody charged to teach me. They just, they just coach me. And so if, if guys come to me, I don't like teaching offensive linemen before the age of they say 16 or, or so, because I don't like pigeonholing, pigeonholing kids at that young as to what position they're going to be. There's right. a lot of chubby 12 year olds that turn out to be tall, lanky 18 year olds. And I don't, I don't really believe in, I, I do try to support the youth leagues as far as flag football goes. I don't mm -hmm. think they need to be in pads before the age of 14 or 15. I think they burn out on it. I don't think it's good for them physically. I think they don't learn the game well. I think they, so I coach for free. I've helped out with the university um, as far as their football program for years, at, um, like hosting parties for the alumni and whatnot at my house, all on my own dime, that kind of thing trying to keep a, a real bond of the guys together. Uh, and then of course, then I coached, I got paid to coach at the university and some other places. And all the while I started becoming a fundraiser for the university, trying to, and I, I raised funds for the entire university. And that, that's amazing. How did you like doing that? Coaching I, and fundraising? I love it. I do. It's uh, the coaching I love fundraising i'm learning <laughs> I to say. But what i love is it keeps me within the community at the university and because tucson's so tied to, to to that university it keeps me within that community as well so uh i've met some incredible business leaders uh philanthropical leaders all uh people who give constantly around town and i love that because it allows me to connect with such a wide variety of people oh, that's amazing yes yeah, sounds so lifted Love it. Well, I like it. I enjoy it. That's the thing. Nice. All right. So now let's get to the fun stuff because I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan you, and you play for the Giants, NFC East. What is it like playing the NFC East? And uh, I think this is one of the toughest divisions. Actually, horrible, horrible division in the past two years, three years, but hopefully they improve. But for you, when you, you play with Michael Strahan, uh, Herschel Walker, Kerry Collins, Jason Garrett, former Cowboys coach, um, and Tiki, Bar uh, Tiki Barber, Amani Tumor. What was it like just competing in the NFC East and playing with, in New York in front of those fans and, 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 and Big Blue? I, I had the best time there. I was the old guy. I don't think, you know, they brought me in to change the personality of the team. They said um, when they were making their pitch as a free agent to me, they're like, here's what we need. Our, our offense doesn't fight back against this defense because the defense was so good with Strahan, yeah. Hamilton, Armstead, Seahorn, Barrow. I mean, the list goes on. It was a great defense. And they said, our offense just doesn't fight back. They don't, they don't have any teeth. They, they just, they, when it goes south, it goes south. I said, all right. And they brought in another old guy, Lomas Brown. And we were the left side tandem. And I had been on enough teams and done enough with guys to kind of figure out how to build that. And so what about building that? And what made it fun is, they rallied around it and the defense loved it. And once the defense loved it and the offense fought back, we became a team and we ended up going to the Super Bowl that year. And I'm not saying it was because of me. I'm saying I was brought in for a purpose and I think I got the purpose done. Being in New York is absolutely energetic. Yeah. The fans there are, 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 you know, lifelong fans that got their tickets from their dad and their grandparents. There is a bit of a corporate feel a little bit because sometimes those, our corporate seats now and so it's not as always as rowdy as you'd like but it's an energy unlike any other it's a big energy of like do well here and the sky's the limit for you personally so all those people that want to have a brand you know you always see that nowadays they've got their own brand better hope they play for the giants yeah your taxes are gonna suck <laughs> really badly but the sky's the limit personally for your own brand if if you want to succeed and you've seen it on that team alone with what Seahorn did, what Strahan's done, uh, and Michael Barrow's got a huge following. There's, it's just an incredible place to be in a city that's completely alive with possibilities at all time. And that was, it was as good as it gets. Now, the AFC East, what was fun about that, other than the trips to Dallas, because that's your long trip, you know, you, you're on a train for an hour to Philly. You know, you take the Acela down, you're in Philly. You take the Acela to Washington. Uh, it's, it's easy to travel within the division. And because of that, the rivalries are so intense. 
you know, I, I had to tell my wife, don't go to the Philly game. You're not going to that game. Why? I said, they'll tip over cars in the parking lot. And it's, well, it's, yeah, I was going to say, come to the link. If you want rowdy, come to the link. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's all, you know, I back and it was the vet when I was going down there. And it's like, you don't understand. They have, yes, yes, yes. Jail. The vet, the vet was the real rowdy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, there's a jail in the basement, a holding cell. It was a crazy place. Uh, yeah. Famously, one of the, one of the radio personalities came down and found his, his car upside down in the parking lot. You know, it was like, it's, it's nuts. And Washington, great fans. They, I have a friend that's been on the Washington waiting list for like 25 years and he's still 70 years out or something crazy. It just, it, it's historical. It's close. It's passionate. It's great rivalries. I mean, I, the, the NFC East back then, you know, yeah, we had to go to Arizona and they didn't have great, that wasn't a great fan base. We were playing, you know, as a transplant team, such and such. You go to Dallas, great fans. It's absolutely out of control. So uh, I think I had my most, I don't want to say my most fun there, but it was kind of, I was in a place where I, I was older. I was in my career. I was about done. I knew it. I wasn't going to be much longer. So I could just sit back and enjoy the ride for the last couple of years. That's fantastic. And I'd like to preface what I'm about to say with saying that I'm always cheering for the Eagles, but I did live in New York the same time you were playing there. And I was cheering for you. I had the honor of seeing a bunch of the giants out often when we were out on the town and, and it's just such a great energy. Tell us about some of your greatest experiences there or one that, that really, you know, a memory. Okay. And this is going to, I sound, love New York. I so love living. I, I, I'm a food and wine guy. Oh yeah. And I got there and they knew that I had worked in, in the off season at wineries and they knew I was really into good food along, well, along with the winery stuff. And our strength coach, mother Dunn, his brother-in-law was Christian Deluvier who was the head chef at, um, I know, I'm, I'm at the St. Regis Hotel, uh, Les, Les Panis. Les Panis. Awesome. And so I, we started out, we took a group of players. There was Jason Garrett, myself, Kerry Collins, Jason Seorn. We went, we had a very nice meal. It was incredible. And they're like, I, their eyes had been open. They had never been out to a place like that. I'm like, just trust me. And they all knew about Mother Dunn's brother-in-law, but they didn't really know what to expect from a classical French incredible restaurant and, and it was yeah Lesbenas was just it was as good as it gets it was a, yeah. I think it was an absolute I think the I think they lost money every year for the hotel but it was such a prestige thing because every it was always among the top one or two you know around with Daniel Ballou and a few others so I got to go to those restaurants it, it, it's amazing what doors open to you when you were the Giants mm -hmm. you know I make a phone call I just have the secretary make a phone call to restaurant Danielle and you're in you, you want to go somewhere you can get in and that's the way new york works and i, I yeah. hate to say it but it's incredible that you can go to these restaurants and uh it, it, the best memory of my time there was a post game my my whole wife's extended family was in town so sister brother their spouses were celebrating their birthday and we we i told we walked into lisbon house and i told christian I had made the reservation. He said, your table's not quite ready. Go in. They, we had champagne and ceviche in the bar. Wow. And we showed up. They said, now, what do you want to do? We said, make us have fun. Just bring out the food. We don't care. We were there, I don't know, about six and a half, seven hours. We wow. must have, I don't know. I think we had eight <laughs> courses. We try to remember them now. <laughs> Wine during with every course. And all of us rolled out of their stuff. And it's a memory we still talk about, the whole family. Wow. And you know, I, do I remember the cost? No, but I, I, <laughs> I remember amazing. the meal. The meal was incredible. And that's that's what you do with a place like that. So yeah, that was the, that's it, my best memory. That right there, my wife telling me she's pregnant with twins on the corner of 42nd and 7th. <laughs> wow. Oh, I love it. Right that's Square. amazing. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, we, were, we were going to a show and... Uh, she showed me her ultrasound. I don't remember. I, I think we were going to see, I don't even know, rent, proof, numbers, some one of those. I don't remember the show. I don't remember anything about it. I just kept thinking twins. Oh my God. We already had two. So yeah. there you go. There you go. You, you went into sainthood. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. She did anyways. Yeah. So, um, so now, uh, what's it like now sharing your life stories and after your NFL career, you're helping out kids now. And obviously you were a TV analyst. What's it like learning, I mean, seeing the game from the different side, different aspect, covering the game, seeing young players develop and even coaching? What, what's that been like for you? 
go for it. So, you know, one thing I've learned after having, you know, after having been an analyst for both the college and pro game for so long, after having played, after having coached, the game is not, it's the same game scheme wise in many ways as it was when I played. It's not fundamentally a sound because because of the money involved in college football now, coaches have to win or they get fired. Yeah. It wasn't that way in the 80s. Now it's win or get fired. So they have to come up with a way to somehow win enough games to not get fired. And what that is, is they followed the high school route of certain types of schemes on offense that allow you to exploit your, your overwhelming superiority. Like, okay, I might not be as good as you at most positions, but I got one or two guys you just can't cover. So all I'm going to find is ways to get them in space, throw on the ball and move on. And that's what you're seeing with the whole spread thing through high school football in the late 90s and early 2000s and how that went all through the college ranks uh, around that same time, you know, starting way back with Hal Mummy and, and whatnot. And what that has happened is then there is a lack of true fundamental football knowledge and technique you know, at a lot of positions. And so the NFL has had to make rules that almost compensate for that. And what, that's why you're not seeing nearly the run game you used to see, um, unless you can somehow manage to scrape together five offensive linemen that all know how to run block. And that's very tough to do. Um, how, if you can find a running back that knows how to run vertically rather than just get in space. So the game, while, while the schemes have remained the same, the, te the techniques and fundamentals have changed. I don't think it's in, in a, I think the athletes out there are as good or better than ever um, in many ways. Most of your offensive linemen now are bigger and stronger than we were, or maybe stronger and faster. They're not all three, but fundamentally they're not as sound and you watch and they don't, they don't, under, they, they don't play the game with the physicality we used to because it's now being changed so they don't have to, thank God, rules-wise, but it's also been changed because that's the way the game is coached at the lower levels now. Hmm. Wow. Glenn, you've created such diversity in your career related to football. Tell us how it was, what was the experience like being an analyst? It was eye-opening and it was a learning curve. You know, it's, it's one thing to be able to talk about a game, but it's another to be able to put it into words that someone who doesn't understand can get it. And also at the same time, keeping it short and succinct and also being able to um, tell the reason why something happened. An analyst's job is to say, why did it happen? Not to prognosticate and say, this is going to happen or to say what happened. They're on TV for God's sakes. They just saw it happen. They don't, I don't need to yeah. tell them. I Did you have like guidelines and timelines that were stressful or? Yes. Well, you know, the first time you have a producer speaking in your ear while you're talking is like, whoa, that's yeah. not easy. Uh, but I luckily I had the best producers right from the start. So when I got to producers that weren't as good, I could handle it. I had such good ones to start with. I, it, I, I could tune out and go on. Um, that's stressful. When you yeah. know you've got a guy who's counting down in your ear to get out, to finish your thought, yet you're where's your attention are your attention i can't imagine that i'm so sensitive <laughs> so that's that, amazing that, that's a pretty tough part of it and then of course making sure that what you're saying is correct and making sure that you're not saying anything you know the, the rule is the mic is always on right it yeah mic is on so don't say something you're going to regret all right wow. so i gotta ask you this um so what was your best moment as an analyst and also what was your experience on the food network <laughs> well, the Food Network was an interesting one. I, I, Charlie Palmer and I, uh, a phenomenal chef who now does a lot out of, uh, out, he had Ariel at the time, which is a great restaurant in, uh, in New York at the time. And now he's out in Healdsburg. He has a, a, a really highly thought of restaurant I haven't been able to get to. They had me in to kind of do a guest shot with them about and be in the kitchen. And I loved it. It was great because Charlie was like, he so understands prep and the true, you know, the, like the trueness of the food and what it is and letting that shine, not trying to dress it up too much, not trying to do too much. And it was great. It was, it was a phenomenal experience to be around a person of that magnitude in that job. You know, anytime you're around a leader in their own field, it's fun because you can, you know how, 
if you can open your eyes, you just wow, that person's amazing at what they do. And that's, and I don't care if it's a guy who's, who's a landscaper, you can tell that guy's great at his job. Right. And so that, that was pretty amazing. And as an analyst, my, my best one ever. Wow. Uh, there's been times where you just make a call you on and you know, like when my stat guy, Sam Polis, who was amazing. And he's also does a lot in the truck and he played football when he's looking at you going, wow, that you nailed that. That's that's the stuff you love. Right. Then when your colleague goes, holy cow, that was a great point you just made. That's what's rewarding. Glenn, you've created so many awesome memories and experiences. What are you going to create next? What's, uh, what's on the agenda? Well, I, I, more and more inspirational speaking. And now that we're coming out of COVID, uh, things are starting to open back up. And I've really been working on the message to get it out there. Uh, particularly for me, it's middle management guys, people that feel stuck in a rut, that, that somehow want to change and get out. Um, you know, it's a powerful thing that, you know, I'm 55, people say, what more can you really do at 55? And I always point to Robert Mondavi. Right. He was dead broke at 53 and died a billionaire. So I'll, uh, Love I'll, just, that. I'll just assume that I can do some more. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And who would you like to, to share the motivational speaking with? Because I think you're amazing. I think that that would be great. Uh, for me, it's, I, I really, I'd love, obviously football teams, college yeah. athletes, those type of things, because so, mo so many of them have come into that um, not really realizing what they've done or how they got there. They just started as a kid and now they're there. And there can sometimes be a real learning curve for them where they don't Absolutely. they don't succeed on the field the way they wanted to, um, or they don't succeed in life the way they wanted to because it was always just kind of there for them and they didn't prepare. It's that group of people, the people that are uh, feeling stuck in their life and you know, uh, say you're in a big corporation but you don't know how to move up. Uh, you've got, you know, big corporations have hundreds of middle management people. So it's a group, great group of people to speak to about. Um, it's one thing to be ambitious. It's another to be disciplined and motivated at the same time and disciplined uh, to do the right thing every day. You know, the discipline always is going to win out over motivation, over anything else. So those are the people I, I like speaking to. Yeah, so, uh, Absolutely. Do, I, do you have a book? I'm sorry. Is that, no, do you no. Have I know I've been, uh, I've, had, I've been told to write one, but I haven't done it yet. Absolutely, absolutely. Voice text it while, yeah. while you're doing all your, everything else that you're doing. <laughs> they say everybody has one book in them. Maybe I'll have one. Who knows? Absolutely. Hey, uh, the past three guests that we had, they all have books. We have to, Glenn, we have to get you, you have to write a book. And also, we got to, absolutely. you have to share your story more. I think your, your story is such an amazing story. And we got to put it on ESPN 30 for 30. <laughs> I'd love that. You get, yes. you get the ball rolling on that, would you? <laughs> yes, we will. We will. Yeah, well, but, thank you so much. You know, so a couple more things. Actually, before we get to the last few things, I just want to get your take. What are your thoughts on today's NFL, the way they're uh, handling it? And also, uh, this year, they're doing the Black National Anthem. And what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that we're heading into the right direction with that situation? You know, I, I'm just a believer in the National Anthem. I just, I, I don't know that it, it has more than one meaning, but I if, if there's a need for the Black National Anthem, if it's stressed, they need it, then I'm okay with it, I guess. Um, where I, I don't know, the NFL, I'm glad, is finally heading in a, where, uh, player safety. Um, and when I say that, I, I, I love the physicality of the old game, but there was a denial that, that things were happening when everybody could tell they were, so at least they're addressing that. I love that. But I, I really, the NFL is about entertainment. And as long as they stick to that core mission, I'm going to love what they do. And I'm going to be a fan. Yeah, the reason why I'm asking all this, this question, particular question, because I'm trying to gather some uh, different opinions. Of, you know, I'm going to write an article about it uh, and talk about and see uh, where we can improve that. But uh, that's the reason why I'm asking. So, yeah, you know, I think when it comes to the flag, yeah. nothing is, is this way. Um, the flag represents an ideal. Mm -hmm. And there is, you can't be perfect in life. No one's ever reached perfection. Yeah. Um, whether you're religious and you believe that to be God or whether you're a scientist, you realize there is no perfection. But that represents the ideal we all want. The ancient Greeks had statues that, that we still talk about, the Adonises, the Greek gods. People didn't look like that, but they could strive to look like that. Mm -hmm. and Or they could strive to think like that or be that type of hero. I think that's what the American flag is for us. It's that ideal. It, it, do we always live up to the ideals in our constitution, our declaration of independence? No, 
but that doesn't mean we don't continue to strive for them. So to me, I look at the flag as the ideal. Okay. Yeah. So That's why I'm really happy about the Olympics right now. I feel yeah. like we needed this. Diversity. You know, this, uh, by the way, these Olympics are awesome so far. Even though there's no fans, it's still, they're, they're still doing a fantastic job. Well, it's the emotion of the of the it's the emotion of the the, the contestants and it's the the life you know this telling those stories which NBC has always done incredibly well tell the stories make let the people in their own words tell you who they are and I mean just watching that girl from Alaska win the breaststroke was amazing yeah. uh, and the hometown going crazy uh, you know me and my wife we tear up every time we watch one of these things happen it's like oh yeah it's amazing I believe that. Yeah. so. Yeah, so the last two things here, um, our team is part of this foundation called the Hugh Jackson Foundation. Um, he's a former NFL coach. He's now the offensive coordinator at Tennessee State with Eddie George. And we're trying to help him prevent human trafficking, making sure the community stays safe and the kids stay safe. So I'll send it to you so you and your, and, so you and your wife can check it out. Thank you. Please do. Um, you know, there's some great things out there. I don't know if you've seen the one, um, the Finder Room, which basically uh, for people who travel, you take photos of your hotel room and they try to match that up with human trafficking oh, wow. photos that are on the website to find out where these people were and track them down. There's a lot wow. there. Um, and I, I, you know, please send me all that information because I think that's, a, that's something we, every person beca can become a detective kind of with this. You can tell when something's not right. Yeah, it's yeah. so horrible out there. And the last thing here, uh, would you like to say anything to all the nurses, doctors, essential workers right now? Just, you know, thank you for putting yourself out there. My mom was a, a nurse and we have wow. friends that are nurses and it's, uh, thank you so much for putting yourself out there for everybody. Yeah, well said. And there it is. That wraps up episode 863 with former NFL office alignment, Glenn Parker, former TV, TV analyst, but now he coaches kids in football. Man, this was awesome. Thank you for coming on. This is truly an honor. And we learned a lot today and your story is such an inspiration. And uh, we, would, we would like to have you back as a returning guest at some point so you can meet the full team, but keep up the great work. We're gonna, we gotta put your story out there more so people learn about it, uh, but you and your family stay safe and enjoy your vacation in uh, New York. Thank you both so much. Have a great day and, and take care and have me back anytime you like. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenn. We appreciate you. Looking forward to the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye.